Hi, Brian O'Rourke here. I'm again with the great Maverick, Michael Scott Scudder. The second round of our chat here. We're in, uh, by the way, Michael, to tell people that are watching, we're in Arlington, Texas. Yeah. It's hot as Hades. <laughs> um, well, uh, we're right next to the ballpark and near the Cowboys Stadium. And right. We're looking out on a almost cloudless day <laughs> that's going to be 108 degrees. Yes, yeah. boy, it's going to be hot as hell. We're not going out there, are we? <laughs> Good. Good. Well, so when we last spoke, we were going to segue a little bit into technology. Mm. Um, and, and, you know, social media, some other things around that, because these are topical, you know, they're pretty popular things people want to talk about nowadays, it seems. Yeah, Tell let me, me, let yeah. me ask you something okay, here. Sure, I'm going sure, sure. I'm, I'm to interrupt you and ask yeah. you something here, because uh, you're as important an interview as I am, truthfully. Oh, well. Um, you know that one of my premises has been that uh, we've done this great job, and I really do believe we've done this great job of selling memberships, quote unquote, over 30 some years. And that really started when EFT came in in the early 80s. We really started selling memberships. Mm -hmm. But my question is, you know, we as an industry, I think brag a little bit that we have 50 million members now. But if you look at the numbers, uh, <laughs> We've lost somewhere in the neighborhood of 100 million people that didn't come back to us, or at least didn't come back to us with any frequency. They might have come back and disappeared again, disappeared, yes. right? Yes. So, you know, one of my premises has been that, yeah, they might have been members, and we might have thought that we had their loyalty because they signed a one-year agreement with right. us to pay or something like that, right. but they never became customers. And I know that you've been very customer-centric. One of the first things you said to me when I met you five years ago was you talked about customer centricity. So where do you see the, this, where has the industry failed as far as customer centricity is concerned? And where does technology, social media, et cetera, fit into that? So, well, it's about a customer engagement. You know, it's about creating an experience for somebody that is um, relevant to them, and that requires, uh, you know, intelligence. It, it requires knowing who they are, what they're doing, and why. And when you learn that, it makes it much easier for you to service them, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, this is not uh, the common um, vernacular in the health club industry. That, the, that thinking is not very common. So uh, what? intelligence enables you to do, uh, especially with the cloud and what's happened with the cost of software. It's gone way, way down. Right. So uh, you would think, and there are some people experimenting with this stuff, you'd think that some smart competitors are going to figure out how to do a better job of servicing customers based on intelligent metrics. And it's not just in the facility itself. It's also in the digital world because increasingly, I think, what's going to be a big, big important thing, as it is with retail, is the melding of the digital and physical experience. So when I'm going to a website to get information or I'm using a device that's tracking what I'm doing here or there, my facility knows that and so we can deliver a combined experience for you, Michael. Uh, you know, we know you're a male, we know the age group you're in, perhaps you have certain interests and we know that you're going to a website to find out maybe about cycling. Uh, so we can communicate with you knowing that in a much more effective way that's going to keep you engaged and give you what you need. That is what you're going to need to see. Well, see, I'll assert to you that uh, exempting the latter, yeah. which you just spoke about, that club operators think they already know this. That, well, but, but, but Brian, I have a database, I have a club management, and, and I have all their information, and they do have to check in. So if you would expand and expound a little bit on what you're talking about because I don't think personally the club owners know much beyond that. Sure, sure, sure. Do you? Well, do you think? No, generally, you know, as a general rule, no. But it, it comes down to actionable things, right? Mm -hmm. So instead of having to sit down and run reports to figure out, you know, who is a si interested in cycling, we're talking about, uh, uh, you know, workflow, I mean, actionable things and information systems so that uh, your system can be set up so that if you're visiting the website looking at cycling and I know you're coming in and I know you're taking cycling classes, the system's set up to automatically communicate with you 
about opportunities for you to do things and also when you go on the web actually deliver customized content for you instead of a static website you're going to see customized content that's really for Michael that's giving Michael what he wants to experience that's going to lead to much greater uh, retention much happier customers and an opportunity to generate a lot of revenue that we're not able to generate you, right you now. mean that on this little custom place whether it, by the way whether it be a website or social media because I'd like to ask you about uh, uh, actually embedding websites inside social media which is this new phenomenon that's yeah. coming up so what you're really saying to me is oh I would have an opportunity to buy something yes. as well that's correct revenue opportunity and and <laughs> that, that your intelligent club management software would know that I was doing that and when I did it, et cetera, not only outside the club, but inside the club. Yeah, is that, that's yeah, yeah it's correct. Yeah, yeah, and it's not just that. I mean, it's just there's so much revenue opportunity. You have to start thinking about how businesses like Amazon operate and these other companies where, you know, customers, when you start understanding metrics behind customers, it gives you opportunities to create tremendous revenue that you don't have, you know, until you know it. And uh, that is the kind of thing you're going to see smart and, and probably well-capitalized competitors start to do which gets back to the overall market trends because as some of these change reach scale you know they're going to be able to implement technology that uh, it's going to be harder for smaller operations to do well this uh, sounds like i'm interviewing you here but yeah. if you're comfortable with that yeah, sure whatever there's something uh, some of uh, the veterans in this industry have known for a long time and that is that old 2080 rule yeah which which is by the way does work it works 20% of your customer base is going to provide you with 80% or more of your ancillary revenue. Right. Now, talk a little bit, if you would, about how intelligent software, intelligent solutions, intelligent identifiers, if you will, actually helps the club of the future, if you will. How does it help do that? Well, what it, it's the long tail. If you read Chris Anderson's uh, work, you know, um, the long tail effect, and that's what digital technology enables, which is that um, there's uh, more or less. The 80-20 rule still applies, but there's this 80% of people that you're able to reach because you're giving them what they want that's very specific to their unique needs. All these micro channels you could never imagine that are all part of our health club business we just haven't had the system of delivery to enable us to monetize those things in a way that impacts revenue and more important to service them okay because there are all these niches of customers that aren't having their needs met uh, it may be as simple as uh, you know uh, you know uh, females who have toddlers who uh, like mind body classes and you know that's a niche that's a customer you know, maybe in the in the life cycle or the, the cycle of a customer breakdown, when you think about the 80-20 rule, that's way down here at the, you know, the 90th percentile. Um, but having that digital uh, platform with physical uh, execution in a facility, it enables you, because customers are coming to your websites. Yeah. You know, they're, 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 you know, they're engaging online, particularly in the social space. Oh, absolutely, they're really coming to social media. And, and if, you're not, if you're not engaging with them around their interest as a brand, you're going to lose them, but secondly, you know, in the long view, but secondly, you're missing an opportunity uh, on multiple levels. So in, in one sense, you're saying that true technological innovation, which is already available and quite inexpensive, yes. true technological innovation uh, is going to enable us to recognize, A, that the customer is coming in, um, let's say with a somewhat open pocketbook, and we're not capitalizing on that at all. That's we're right. still selling this thirty-nine or forty-nine dollar a month bundled membership right. that one price fits all, and you can have all this, which is not a workable model. Right. Maybe we'll get into that in another interview. Right. But what you're saying is that the customer really is coming in. More and more of them willing to buy, and we simply don't have a way of identifying that. Yeah, and, and have not identified it. That's correct. That's wow. correct. Wow. I mean, look look at, um, you know, digital commerce. Uh, I mean, there's just so many ways of doing that. You can look at other models. I mean, in the retail space, let's look, for example, at another industry. 
retail now almost 50 cents of every dollar of merchandise is purchased via online. Okay, and, and the smart brands, whether they're at the high end of the scale, Neiman Marcus, or whether they're at the low end scale, Walmart, they're all delivering merchandise both in bricks and mortar and via digital engagement. And when you're going to a Walmart website, they know who you are. Yep. And so what you're seeing on the sides of your screen are products that they're learning that you're going to like. It's, it's intelligence. What that does is that drives engagement, it drives revenue. That's what I'm talking about. I just, I just got two days ago an email from Walmart that says, by the way, we know that in the past you have purchased such and such, now available at our store, Taos, New Mexico, little Taos, New Mexico. And I thought to myself, wow, how smart is that? You know, they really, in a way, are showing interest in me. I know they want to sell to me, okay, fine. I mean, that's what I go to Walmart for, is to buy something. But they're showing interest in me. So you're, you're also saying that Club owner, take a look at this. Here is a way that seamlessly and almost effortlessly you can show interest in your customer. Right, and you can target it around certain practical needs. So, you know, I'll bring up cycling again. You know, okay. so, you know, I like to cycle. Right. And, uh, you know, that means that equates to me taking an RPM class uh -huh. in my facility. Right. Uh, it means that I'll go riding with friends. Uh, it means that there are certain unique needs I'm going to have or be more prone to be interested in as a cyclist. Mm -hmm. So when you think about that as a customer, bringing in another variable, think now about how so many bricks and mortar health clubs are continuing to market uh, with generic messaging across broad spectrums of people. You mean continuing to unmarket? That, yeah, <laughs> and, and, and you know, with the semi industry yeah. versus think about. You can target Facebook ads to people who have interest in cycling. And by the way, if you know that I'm interested in cycling and you're already connected with me on Facebook and you know my profile, then I am connected with a bunch of other cyclists more than likely, right? Mm -hmm. So this is where, by servicing me very well, by anticipating my needs as a cyclist who happens to come into the club six days a week unless I'm traveling, what am I going to be? I'm going to be engaged. And you know what I'm going to be telling all my cyclist buddies? This is great. And by the way, they've negotiated a great deal with the spokesman down the road for some pipes. And we're going to coordinate a, you know, again, this is, a, you start rethinking the business model from a membership perspective to a customer perspective. Yeah. And you start redefining opportunity for revenue generated. It just re, it makes you rethink everything. I have to ask you a question. Does your health club, recognize and give you credit for that you do go out and cycle on Saturday morning no, with your no. buddies? No, I don't. And, and listen, Isn't I, that ridiculous? Well, it, listen, I have a wonderful club and I really I I like know. those people, but I don't ever even get an email. And you know why? Because if you talk to most people in the health club industry who are very respected, the, the, the thinking is, and you out there know what I'm talking about, let sleeping dogs lie. Don't communicate with members because they're going to realize that they've been paying us every month and they're going to cancel. Right. What kind of philosophy is that? And you wonder why attrition rates are 40 and 50 percent. Well, you know, in today's world, you cannot hide. You know, you've got to accept that. That's why so many health club owners, and I'm sure you see this, I do when I'm out there, they are scared to death of social media because you cannot hide in the social media yeah. world. Yeah. If your club is dirty and you're not taking care of people and you're not engaging people and you don't have a lot of fans, you're or better or worse, if you're mistreating people, you're going to be in trouble. Mm -hmm. This is nowhere to hide. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 